that same yearning for freedom that nearly 250 years ago gave birth to a special place called America. It was a small cluster of colonies caught between a great ocean and a vast wilderness. It was home to an incredible people with a revolutionary idea that they could rule themselves, that they could chart their own destiny, and that together they could light up the entire world. Well, a happy Friday evening to you, brothers and sisters. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Thank you for joining me on Praying for America, where we gather with patriots and Christians from across the country to pray for one another, to pray for the country, to pray for our politics in this nation and how it is panning out, and to pray for the future of our children, grandchildren, and Fellow citizens, what kind of country will they live in? We are shaping that today. And we're very aware, all of us together, of our responsibilities and of our opportunities in that arena. So thanks for joining me. We're going to go into scripture today. I want to comment for you. And remember, we don't just, one of the unique things about this program, it's not simply commentary on the political news. We pray over it as well. So we're going to start with prayer. Then I want to comment on two important stories. One, the change of one of the Democrat U.S. senators leaving the Democrat Party. And secondly, the Supreme Court and what they are doing right now in an important case concerning United States elections. So both of those have important implications as we continue to work to craft America first policies, policies that embody and defend uh, the values, the freedoms that we uh, that we enjoy, but do not take for granted. So at the end of Mark's gospel, we read um, the following uh, words. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Let us pray. Lord God, we live in a nation that was founded by believers, believers in your word, believers in your truth, in your gospel, believers who knew they too had a commission, as do we all, to proclaim the gospel to all creation. Lord, we thank you that we live in a nation structured according to principles that are found in your word. Not a theocracy, but an independent government that nevertheless is rooted in an awareness of God and of the difference between right and wrong. Rooted in the awareness of human weakness 
and the need to be protected against the corruption of power. Thank you, Lord, for giving us all an understanding of these things and for giving us all the opportunities to defend them for the sake of future generations. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, friends, what I also want to do before this program is over is say a prayer of blessing specifically for you and whatever your needs might be. Maybe there are needs related to health, finances, relationships, important decisions that need to be made, career opportunities, discernment, whatever it might be. Yeah, I know that your needs are many. We all have many needs. Indicate in the comments, if you like, on whatever of the many platforms out there you're watching us on, indicate in the comments what those needs might be, if you wish to let us know how we can pray for you. And we'll do so. We'll all pray for each other together, because that, of course, is part of praying for America, praying for one another. I want to say a word before we go to the the U.S. senator that just uh, left the Democrat Party. Hakeem Jeffries. Now, thank you, uh, Representative uh, Hakeem, for giving us a new word for disaster. Uh, This is one of the many living disasters in the United States Congress. Hakeem Jeffries, who was recently uh, elected to be the House uh, Minority Leader for the Democrats. They'll be going into the minority come January. Um, And one of the blessings, of course, of the new year. But this this guy is a real a real disaster, and I just wanted to point out. And you, by the way, you're going to be hearing from us, okay, about that uh, constantly um, during this coming Congress. Uh, we'll 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 point out the many ways in which uh, you are a disaster, Hakeem. Uh, he frequently referred to the 2016 election as rigged, a hoax, illegitimate. President Trump as a fake and so-called president. Oh, yes. those You know how those words kind of come back to you tenfold, um, Hakeem Jeffries. Um, artificially, uh, Russia, 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 Russia put him in the White House, accused Republicans of cheating in the 2016 election, advocated for investigating the whole thing. So now... The living disaster has changed his tune. Just last week, this man, who will be hearing a lot from us, blasted election. This is there. He's these are his words coming out of the mouth of disaster. Election deniers who poison our democracy. Do you care to apologize for having been one yourself? I'm not going to hold my breath. The man's a disaster. You know, the whole party is a disaster. That's why they elect somebody like this. Whom they elect just reflects who they are. What a what a what a bunch of a bunch of clowns, brothers and sisters. They're just a bunch of clowns. Now, going over to the Senate side, let me go over to the board here because we have somebody that um, has given us some help in various ways. Arizona Senator, U.S. Senator, okay, Kirsten Cinema. Now, you may recall, together with West Virginia U.S. Senator Joe Manchin, she stood firm uh, for the filibuster, the rule in the Senate that in, in, over, in order to overcome a filibuster, in other words, in order to get to the point where you stop debating on a particular bill and you proceed to vote on it, either yes or no, you have to have not a majority, but 60 votes. Not 51, but 60. So it requires, in other words, it's a mechanism that requires that there be more consensus. If, some, if one party is objecting to a matter and they, 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 they don't want there to be a vote on it, uh, you've got to have crossover, usually, unless a party has 60 seats in the Senate, which is not easy to get. Not impossible. It has happened. But um, 
it requires a lot of consensus, in other words, uh, for that many uh, senators to say, okay, we're going to proceed with a vote on this on this matter. Now, you can vote to proceed for a vote and then vote against it if you want. You know, you can do that. Okay. In any case, she has stood together with uh, Senator Manchin uh, and prevented what would have been really problematic if they had done away with uh, the, the filibuster, because you can change the rule about the filibuster with a simple majority of 51 votes. She refused to, uh, to do that. But now she has left the Democrat Party. Now, what does that mean? Because we know that we just had the election in Georgia. We talked about it the other day, um, which would leave the Democrats in the Senate with a 51 vote majority to 49 Republican. Now, what, what, what's, in, what's important to understand here is this. It's not technically 51 Democrats anyway, even if she stayed Democrat. She has, let me just finish the thought here. She has left the Democrat Party and has become a registered independent. Not a Republican, but an independent. Now, the 51 is actually 49-2. There are 49 Democrats and two independents. This is prior to what Senator Sinema just did. Now, of course, it's 48-3. The three are independents. So you want to look at the, what the makeup of the Senate is. It's actually, again, moving forward to looking ahead to, uh, to January. Let's use the color coding. It's 49 Republicans. It's 48 Democrats. And it's three independents. That is now cinema. And who else? Sanders is technically an independent. And Angus King. Not as well known to most people. Okay. What happens in the Senate with these three independents? The question becomes with whom do they caucus? With whom do they vote? Which party's policies? I mean, because if you're independent, it's like, hey, you know what? I could vote, you know. I mean, technically, every senator has the independence to vote the way he or she wants. But usually what we see in the House and the Senate, we see party line voting, right? Now, I don't think it should be as strong as it is. Because you want to have a living human being sitting in those chairs who's evaluating the issues and voting according to what they believe is best for the American people. So that means there should probably be more independence in the Senate and in the House. But what we end up seeing is party line voting. Now, if you take party line voting too far, and every time you have a vote on whatever the issue is, you see, oh, well, you know, Democrats voted for it and the Republicans voted against it, or vice versa. you got to ask yourself the question, are these senators, you know, thinking for themselves to any extent at all? A and reading the bills and studying the implications that those bills have for the American people, especially the Americans in their, in their particular state, whom they're representing, and coming to a conclusion in conscience and, and, and in liberty, um, party line voting taken to its extreme, it's like you're electing a, a, just a bunch of voting machines. Just click the button. Oh, here's the Democrat position. Okay, everybody fall in line. It's just a big vote. You're just electing a voting machine. We've got to get a little more to the, to the point where we've got people who are thinking for themselves. I mean, look... In the issue I deal with, abortion, you know, you look at the at the votes on, on this, anything having to do with this issue, and with very, very, very few exceptions, these are party line votes, and you know, you have to scratch your head and you th and think, 
do these people really, does each of them really come to the conclusion in their own mind and heart and conscience after careful consideration and prayer that it's okay to dismember a living child in the womb even at six, seven, eight, nine months into the pregnancy? What is it about belonging to one or another party that has to blind you to the fact that that's just wrong? The fact is that these independents, now we don't know yet about cinema. We have to see what her behavior is going to be. But if they caucus with the Democrats, if they end up voting with the Democrats, that is what, I should put this in blue, that is what effectively brings about a 51 seat majority, and so you have the breakdown 51-49. And for convenience sake, we say 51 Dems, 49 R's, but it's technically 48 Dems, 49 Republicans, and three independents. Okay, so how independent is she going to be? Time will tell. Time will tell. It'll differ, perhaps, vote by vote, issue by issue. So that's the, the situation, the way, the way things stand here. And really, it's, a, it's, a, it's not completely surprising because you look at her statements, her positions, her pattern of voting over the years, and you see that she uh, has an independent streak uh, that she has exercised and made known, uh, particularly, uh, as I uh, said, on the matter of the filibuster. Okay. So let's, I want to go back to my chair here and let's pray about this right now. Bring the power of prayer to this whole discussion. And uh, for Senator Cinema, for Senator uh, Manchin, who, uh, although he has been somewhat like this, he has also disappointed people in a lot of ways. But let's just bring this whole situation to prayer right now as believers. Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the United States Senate. We prayed for the Senate yesterday. We pray again today because we see signs of the movement of, of your Spirit when somebody stands up and says, I am not to be automatically counted on for voting with my party. I am not in agreement with all the partisanship uh, I want to think through for myself what is good for the American people, what is good for the people I represent. Lord, we ask you that you would even increase this spirit of independence among these senators. That yes, one can belong to a party. Yes, one can even be loyal to a party. But not to the point that we do not think for ourselves. Not to the point that we compromise our values, not to the point that we don't care anymore what really will work for the American people, what is really good for the people we represent. No, not to that point. Lord God, strengthen the will, strengthen the spirit, strengthen the determination of the people that are in these positions to do what is good and right for the American people. We pray for Senator Cinema right now that the step she has taken may be confirmed within her own heart and mind and soul and by the encouragement of others around her who will say, yes, yes, a move of this type is beneficial, if for nothing else than to be a signal, not only to other senators and other members of Congress, but to all in elected office and indeed to all our fellow citizens, a signal that the way we approach each and every issue, the way we approach each and every vote, should indeed be based on principle, not simply on party loyalty. That it should be based on an awareness of what is right and wrong, not simply on what party leadership has told us to do that it should be based on what is good for the American people and not simply about opposing a political adversary or winning a victory over the opposition party, but, Lord, rather the focus on your people 
and indeed the focus on you. What you, Lord, as the king of every nation, would want us to do, what you, Lord, would want us to be. We ask all this through the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who died and now lives forevermore, and who reigns forever, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, second big topic, brothers and sisters, and then again, I want to pray for you. So as a reminder, leave your intentions in the comments. If you have financial needs, if you have relationship needs, if you have problems or concerning your, your job or your career, if you have big decisions to make, what is it that you need us to pray for you about? Leave that in the comments because we're all going to pray for one another. But the other big topic, let me go back to the board and lay this out for you. It is the Supreme Court and elections. Topic that, of course, has come up before. We've talked about it in many ways and for many reasons. But now, the court is currently hearing a case called Moore v. Harper. And um, what's going on here with this case has to do with a clause in the Constitution. Let me uh, go to it and uh, read it for you. It's Article 1 of the Constitution, Section 4. The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress, that is the Federal Congress, may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. Okay, so to sum it up, state legislatures set the norms for federal elections. in those states. So in other words, how will the people of Illinois vote for the President of the United States? How will the people in Illinois vote for the senators in the uh, and, the, and the representatives in the United States Congress. How will those federal elections be conducted in that state? Well, the timing, the place, the manner, the laws about the ballots, mail-in ballots, uh, uh, what's the requirements of the ballots? Do they have to have a signature on the outside? Would they have to be in by a certain time of day? The Constitution itself. puts that in the hands of the state legislatures to decide. Okay, so for a case to get to the Supreme Court, there must be a dispute somewhere, right? What's the question that's in dispute here? What's going on? Constitution seems clear enough, right? So here's what the question is. You've got what the Constitution says. All right, we saw it, Article 1, Section 4. You've got what it says, right, about the state legislatures, okay? So you've got here, this case comes up out of North Carolina. So you've got the North Carolina state legislature. All right. One of the things that the state legislatures do after the census every 10 years, remember there was a census in 2020, is they look at how the population has changed, according to the census report, and because congressional districts depend on, on uh, population, they redraw the map of the congressional districts, the boundaries of what geographic area a particular representative of Congress represents change. Now, they, they may change or they may not change. It may change a little bit. They may change a lot. There might be new districts that arise, old districts that get absorbed into neighboring districts. So what they did was they drew a new map, 
perfectly legitimate after the census. We talked about this, that, that the fact that they would their various states would be doing this, the, the way these maps are drawn varies from state to state. But the North Carolina state legislature did their job. Now, the North Carolina state legislature right now is dominated by Republicans. And the map that was drawn, well, it favors Republicans. But that's just the political reality. That doesn't change the constitutional provision that they're the ones responsible for the manner of, of uh, conducting elections. However, because it was, well, because there were complaints about, hey, wait a minute, this favors the Republicans a little bit too much, the North Carolina Supreme Court stepped in. This is the state court now, right? The North Carolina Supreme Court stepped in and did what? They threw out the map. They invalidated the new boundary lines that the legislature had set up. The legislature complained and said, wait a second. It's the U.S. Constitution that gives us the authority to do that. So North Carolina Supreme Court, you, vi you violated the Constitution. You can't tell us that our map is invalid. We did this on the authority of the U.S. Constitution, which is higher than the state constitution. That is the question of this case. Now, this is important. This has implications nationwide. It gets complicated pretty fast because, you know, when you say, well, the legislature has authority over the elections, okay, the question really boils down to exactly how much authority and who else can step in. Does the governor have a role? Does the state court have a role? Does the state constitution override what the state legislature might say, even though it has its authority from the U.S. Constitution? You see how it can get pretty complicated. And the justices right now, they just had, I'm bringing this up now because they just had the oral arguments day before yesterday. The oral arguments are always a, a, a critical phase in any Supreme Court case, because then the justices meet shortly after that, and they, they take an initial vote as to where they're coming down on the, on the question in dispute. But you see, the point is, also, we have other people interfering with the provisions of the state legislatures in various states. So what happens if a state legislature says the only ballots that can be counted in an election have to be in by 8 p.m. on election day. Otherwise, they're invalid, they're illegal, they can't be counted. And a state election official or a secretary of state, neither one of whom belong to the, the legislature, say to the election workers, oh, it, you can ignore that. You can accept the ballots uh, right up until midnight or even into the next day or the next three days or the next three weeks. Who has the authority to determine the timing, the timing and the manner in which elections are, are conducted? The U.S. Constitution doesn't say it's the Secretary of State, doesn't say it's the, the local election officials. It says it's the state legislature. You see why wow, this is such an important point. We don't know what the Supreme Court is going to say. We never know exactly what they're going to say. But we do know the implications that a case like this can have. So I, I invite you now, we're gonna, I'm going to sit down again. We're going to pray about this. Uh, pay attention to this case, the Moore, Moore v. Uh, Harper, and uh, we'll see how it turns out for America and for the state legislatures and for future elections, including the, the very important 2024 election. Father, we ask you to send your spirit upon the justices of the Supreme Court, as they consider not only this, but so many other important consequential uh, cases and disputes that are before them. May they decide based on the spirit of wisdom that comes from you, O oh God. May they decide based on a true concern for the good of the American people. May they decide based on principles of integrity. And may they decide based on the U.S. Constitution and not on their own personal 
preferences. Bless those who are arguing this case, who have argued this case. Bless the legislators of North Carolina. And Lord, bless the legislatures across our country that they too may understand their responsibility and do their job. Lord, we ask you to bless the secretaries of state, the attorneys general, the governors, that they may do their jobs too, but only their jobs, that they may stay away from uh, interfering in the business that is constitutionally given to others, that they may not unduly interfere with or try to influence the conduct of elections in their state, and certainly not permit, order, or instruct others to violate the provisions that the state legislature has put forward. Give them the integrity, Lord, to keep within their own lane, to do their job faithfully, and to respect the decisions of the people as expressed not only through their votes, but through their elected representatives. And for this now we pray in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Well, this is great, friends. Thanks for being with me tonight. And now we're going to pray for you because you have many needs. And I thank those of you that have expressed those needs in the comments tonight. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you and to meet those needs. Father, your people come before you tonight for many, many different reasons and with many different needs. And all of us united as the body of Christ in believing in the words of your Son, that when two or three agree to pray for anything whatsoever, it will be granted. So we come together tonight because we who pray for America are praying for the citizens of America. We're praying for our brothers and sisters who, even though we may not know as friends, we may not be acquainted with, nevertheless, we know they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So pour out your bless, abundant blessing, Lord, and your spirit upon all the needs that have been expressed here tonight and all the needs that are held in the privacy of our hearts, where wisdom is needed to make decisions, Lord, enable your people to make the right decisions, where protection is needed, give protection, where there are sorrows that need your consolation, send the spirit of consolation, where there are financial difficulties, send needed help, where there are relationship problems, send guidance, healing, and the ability to make and stick with helpful solutions and decisions. And Lord, for all the other needs, spoken or unspoken, whatever they may be, send forth your spirit and give us the grace to fulfill your call in whatever situation we find ourselves. We ask all this in the name of Jesus the Lord, and we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, remember, as President Trump tells us, we are part of the greatest political movement in American history. Stay connected. Connect with me on social media at FR Frank Pavone. Let's stay connected and encouraged. Let's tell others about this program. And remember, as President Trump also reminds us, this country doesn't belong to those who are trying to destroy it. It belongs to us. And in that we rejoice. And for that we give thanks. And to that we recommit all our efforts. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday.
Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it.